It is a humbling privilege this morning for me to preach and for Barber to preside at communion. I'm very grateful for, to Robin for the invitation to share her pulpit. She sets a high standard Sunday by Sunday, doesn't she? Amen? Amen. Offering us hope and courage in a scary time. Barbara and I are also so very grateful to have found this co congregation after a too often frustrating search. Due to the side effects of my chemotherapy, we aren't here in person as much as we might like, but we rarely miss the online service and feel privileged to support this church with our prayers, our love, and our wallets. If you ever think that your extended family is the only one that seems dysfunctional or who has issues, then I invite you to take some solace in the stories to be found in the book of Genesis. From Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel to Noah and his sons to Lot and his daughters to the long lineage of Abraham and Sarah and their often messed up descendants. All of these characters of, are full of flaws and foibles, failings and fecklessness. Today's story is of Isaac and Rebecca and their children. Isaac was the son of Abraham and Sarah, the first generation of what comes to be identified as the Hebrew people. After Abraham and Sarah had followed God's call to move to a new land, they were blessed with Isaac, who grows up and marries Rebecca. And that is where we pick up the story for today, with Rebecca pregnant with twin sons whom they would name Esau and Jacob. But it was not an easy pregnancy. Did you hear that line in the scripture? The children contended with one another within her, and she said, if this is going to be the way it is, why would I want to live? These two, who already struggling in the womb, will turn out to be at odds with each other from then on out, always contending, always fighting with one another over everything. And even though they are twins, they don't look or act anything alike. Esau, red-complected, with much auburn hair, and Jacob, with very little hair. Esau, the hunter, the hunter of wild game who enjoyed cooking it for his father. And Jacob, the boy who stayed at home brooding and thinking and planning. These two, did you hear it, had even contended at the moment of their birth. Esau arrived first, but just barely. Not a minute later, Jacob is born, holding on to Esau's heel. Have you heard that saying, he sold his birthright for a mess of pottage? Today's story is where that saying comes from. It means to trade away or to give up something that is very important or valuable for something that's not important or valuable at all. To trade away the essential in favor of the trivial. And it also often means that in doing so, what is given up is gone forever and what is gained is soon no more, a mess of pottage. That was the case for Esau. His life was changed forever by trading away his birthright, two-thirds of his inheritance, his share of the estate as the firstborn in that pottage moment to become instead simply one of the many heirs of Isaac, lumped in with all the other members of the household 
for a small share of his father's estate. And so instead of having the resources to become a successful rancher and farmer like his parents and grandparents, he ends up having to leave and seek his livelihood elsewhere. And while we may think it unfair that two-thirds of the inheritance went to the firstborn son as a birthright, it was nonetheless the way things were, and Esau knew it. And yet he traded away that inheritance, that birthright, for a belly full of beans that would last a few hours, a mess of pottage. But let's not be too hasty to judge Esau here because he is us sometimes, isn't he? After all, haven't you or I sometimes traded away something valuable for a fleeting satisfaction or pleasure? And sometimes that pleasure turned out to not even be that pleasurable. I mean, have you ever said something and even as the words were coming out of your mouth, you knew that they might feel good for a moment, but that they would never be able to be taken back, and they would strain a relationship forever. A mess, a pottage. Or have you ever just had to have the last word? You just had to. And that word was the word that escalated things far beyond where they ever needed to be and which made healing and reconciliation nearly impossible, a mess of pottage. Have you ever said no when you could have just as easily said yes and a yes would have made someone's life so much more joyful, a mess of pottage? Have you ever stood by while a racist or a trans or a homophobic or an anti-Semitic joke was told in your presence and instead of calling the person out on it or even in not just not joining in the laughter, you said nothing or you went ahead and laughed because it was easier than not laughing, a mess of potting. I know that I have done all these things and sometimes traded something truly important for something fleeting and cheap. I have sometimes gone for short-term safety rather than long-term integrity. I have sometimes let my words come too quickly when I should have kept my mouth shut or sometimes said nothing when I should have spoken up a mess of pottage. Let me shift direction here a bit. The story of Isaac and Rebecca, of their parents and their descendants, are the stories of what will help form the nation of Israel as it develops over the coming centuries from a wandering extended family to a nation headquartered in Jerusalem with a king and a set of law and judges and all the things that nations have. And as nations sometimes will, in the centuries to come, the Hebrew nation would lose its way and would need to be called back by the prophets, Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and the rest. But there is a sense in which every single prophetic word that later comes to the Hebrew people when it is needed is always rooted in that lesson learned from Esau's awful trade, and that is this. Don't ever give up what is truly important for a mess of pottage. Don't give up the emphasis on justice for the widow and orphan. Don't trade that away. Don't give up 
the godly virtue of hospitality for the allures of being suspicious of outsiders. For while xenophobia, hatred of the stranger, the immigrant, the other, is mighty seductive, it trades away the best of what call, God calls us to be for a mess of pottage. And on this long weekend, when we celebrate our nation's birth, I look back on our history as a people, as a nation, and remember that the truly marvelous thing about the United States the truly unique thing, the thing that ought to be at the root of any pride or patriotism that we may have is that we are a country founded not on ethnicity or language or kinship or region or class or caste or wealth, but on a set of ideas that all human beings are created equal and are to be given equal rights under the law equal opportunity, and all are to be free. That's the furthest thing from a mess of pottage that there could be. Now, of course, I am oh so painfully aware that we as a nation haven't always lived up to those ideals. Yet I can still read President Lincoln's words from his second inaugural address and get goosebumps with malice toward none and charity for all. Let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. With malice towards none. What an amazing thing to have said in March of 1865. But as we all know, after Lincoln's assassination, that grand, healing, godly, reconciling vision was traded away for the nasty pottage of Jim Crow laws and the denial of voting rights to black folks and the denial of property rights to those of Japanese and Chinese descent and a climate of hatred that made lynchings a public after church sport in too many places and a culture that blacklisted and persecuted and too often murdered those whose sexual orientation was different and a set of vicious immigration laws in the 1920s that went hand in hand with the persecutions of that era and sacrifice too many children on a pernicious doctrine that separate schools could ever possibly be equal. Amen. A mess a pottage. And on this morning, my friends, I fear that the temptation to go for the pottage too often pervades our national life today. I am horrified by the pottage of laws that allow the government to interfere too often with deadly results with decisions that women make about their bodies. I'm dismayed and disturbed by the chopped pottage chosen by those who blithely insist that there is no institutional racism, no matter how many black lives are destroyed, no matter how huge the gap in wealth after two centuries of slavery and another of Jim Crow laws, no matter the continuing dramatic wage gap, no matter the stunningly different incarceration rates, and I am enraged by those who seem to love the Second Amendment more than the First Commandment, even at the continuing cost of bullet-riddled babies' bodies. I'm saddened and frustrated by those who prefer the pottage of a supposed God who delights in content, content, condemning people for who they are and whom they were made to love 
instead of the glorious elixir of knowing that God makes no mistakes and revels in our diversity. One of the terrifying lessons to be learned from Esau's story is that some choices and some decisions bring consequences that cannot ever be undone. But on this Independence Day weekend, the good news, news for our country is not only is America founded on a powerful and moral set of ideals, those ideals are also meant to be self-correcting. That is, they carry within themselves the possibility of becoming ever more true when they have not been as true as they should have been. But perhaps a story tells it better. 23 years ago tomorrow, Barbara and, uh, and our youngest and I and our youngest daughter found ourselves in Ely, Nevada. If you've been to Ely, anybody been to Ely? Okay. You know it's a pretty hard scrabble place set amidst a desolate landscape hours from the next real town. That night, we found ourselves at the county fairgrounds, sitting on the hood of our car, parked there with hundreds of others to watch the fireworks light up the desert sky. On one side of us was parked a young Hispanic American mother and three small children. As the fireworks burst over our heads, those children excitedly waved the tiny American flags they had clutched in their hands, saying, Mira, Mira, look, look. Parked on the other side of us was a family of Laotian American refugees who were sharing a meal of hot dogs and french fries and who were also completely captivated with the incandescent tribute to freedom above their heads. In front of us was a family of Japanese American folks whose grandparents, we learned, had been interned by their country not that far from where we sat tonight, and they too shouted with excitement at each explosion. Parked behind us was a Muslim American family dressed in beautiful robes and whose children had little American flag stickers on their chests. A couple of cars over was a gay couple shyly holding hands and expressing their delight along with the rest of us and clapping as the awesome desert sky was bewitched with beauty. And we, we, Scots Irish, English, and German descendants, got lumps in our throats. And I remembered why I care so much for this country and why I so wanted to continue to strive for, uh, to live up to the ideals that gave it life. Because when we are at our best, we do indeed say, no, thank you to the pottage of hatred that gets placed before us. And we do instead seek to make even more real, even more true our commitment to freedom for all, to welcoming everyone with malice towards none, seeking to live out those words inscribed on the Statue of Liberty about welcoming all those who yearn to be free. The tragedy of Esau is that his choice was irrevocable and the consequences unchangeable. But my friends, the good news this morning for you and me as individuals and as a nation is that the grace of God offers us transformation in every moment. The grace of God offers us the courage not to eat from that bowl of pottage, but instead to reach for those things that will truly nourish us. The grace of God will allow us always, if we will but believe and act, 
to correct what needs correcting and make possible what might have seemed impossible. And isn't that better than a mess of pottage?